So let's look into our study today. We're in the book of Proverbs. We're in chapter 30. Let's begin reading at verse 1. I'll read to verse 3. We'll get into our study. Proverbs chapter 30, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 3. The words of Agur, the son of Yaqeh, his utterance. This man declared to Ithiel, to Ithiel and Uchal. Now, how would you like to be named that, by the way? I know I'm just massacring these names, but unless you're Jewish, you don't know that. Surely I am more stupid than any man and do not have the understanding of a man. I neither learned wisdom nor have knowledge of the Holy One. Now, that's an interesting way to begin his words, the words that are recorded here, the words of Agur, the son of Jacob. Um, the last two chapters of Proverbs, chapters 30 and 31, are attributed to different writers. It, it would seem that Solomon did not write chapter 30 or 31, because you see in verse 30 how it begins the words of Agur. Now, some identify Agur with Solomon, but that's unsub unsubstantiated. So the simple interpretation that is basically accepted by the commentators that I, that I, I use in my preparation of studies is that uh, Agur has words that he's sharing with two other men, one named Ithial, the other is Uchal. So it says in verse, uh, verse uh, 1, that this man declared to Ithiel. So when it says this man declared to Ithiel, the word declared, it's interesting because the word declared speaks of a prophetic word, or this is a word of deep importance. And so what he's saying here is that uh, he is giving a revelation of God because God gave revelation to prophets. He is the one who gives inspired words and so he's basically simply saying this is a declaration or inspired words. And these are words of revelation that he's giving. But he begins with humility. When you see in verse 2, surely I am more stupid than any man, that is a, uh, a way of, of speaking with humility. So he says, I don't have the understanding of a man. I neither learned wisdom. I haven't been rabbinically trained. I haven't gone through the seminaries and all. I neither learned wisdom nor have knowledge of the Holy One. Um, I'm simply beginning this with a confession of ignorance of the things that please the Lord the most. And so, as mentioned, this is an expression of humility. He simply doesn't want to appear prideful in the words that he's about to communicate. You see that kind of attitude when you look at other men who are inspired by God to write. For example, there was a man by the name of Amos. And in Amos chapter 7, verses 14 and 15, it says there that Amos answered Amaziah, I was neither a prophet nor a prophet's son, but I was a shepherd, and I also took care of sycamore fig trees. But the Lord took me from tending the flock, said to me, go prophesy to my people Israel. It's another way of saying I had a humble occupation. I don't present myself of having deep wisdom and deep learning, but God chose to use me to take and declare his message. Um, Jesus in Matthew 11, verse 25, is recorded as saying, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you've hidden these things from the wise and learned, reveal them to little children. And so basically that's a word of humility that's coming from verses two and three. He's simply saying, I'm more stupid. I have less knowledge and understanding. Uh, I don't have the understanding of a man. I'm not, I don't even have the understanding of the most common people. I didn't go to rabbinic school. I've neither learned wisdom nor have I knowledge of the Holy One. That, not that he doesn't know him, but he's saying I don't have the kind of depth of knowledge that would make me somebody special. So it's all humility, and now he begins to ask some questions. Verse 4, who has ascended into heaven or descended? Who has gathered the wind in his fists? Who has bound the waters in a garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name, if you know? So interestingly, he began by saying, I'm stupid. Then he makes all of us look stupid. <laughs> by asking a series of questions. Who has ascended into heaven? Well, 
Lest others elevate themselves and ignore his words, he begins to ask a series of questions. And the questions are intended to magnify the majesty of God. And so his point here, as we look at this, is it's ridiculous for man to think that he can explain God. And it's ridiculous for man to pretend that he can understand God completely. You might want to remember that always. Because today there are quite a number of people in universities and outside of universities who seem to think that they're smarter than God. And so he's making it very plain that, that obviously that man is, is infinitely less than God. This is revealing nothing, the nothingness of man. And it's, it's revealing how, how much nothingness we really possess uh, in contrast to the uh, majesty of our creator. Uh, Isaiah asked a question. If you take notes, it's found in chapter 40, verse 13. Who has understood the mind of the Lord or instructed him as his counselor? And Isaiah would be saying in modern terms, has God sent you a text message asking for advice? Who has understood the mind of the Lord? And has God ever asked you, please counsel me, I have some problems. In Job 37 verse 5, God's voice thunders in marvelous ways. He does great things beyond our understanding. Psalm 145 verse 3, great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. Job 11 verses 7 through 9 asks the question, uh, can you fathom the mysteries of God? Can you probe the limits of the Almighty? They are higher than the heavens. What can you do? They are deeper than the depths of the grave. What can you know? Their measure is longer than the earth and wider than the sea. And so the point he's making is very simple. God is great and we are not. What's interesting as he asked these questions, who has ascended into heaven or descended, speaks of the gathering of wind in his fists, binding the waters in a garment, establishing all the ends of the earth. He asked the question, what is his name? And what is his son's name, if you know? And so in these questions that we see here, Christians have, have seen a prophetic picture of Jesus Christ. Who has ascended into heaven or descended? What is his son's name? Well, ascended and descended is a prophetic picture of the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ who has gathered the wind in his fist, who has bound the waters in a garment. This is a picture of his, his all power, his omnipotence. Man cannot control the wind. The wind determines on its own in a natural sense. It, it, like Jesus said, the wind blows where it desires. Man doesn't say where it's going to go. It, it, it blows where it wills. And, and he's saying that you cannot bind up water in clouds. And so he's speaking of the omnipotence of God, the greatness of God. In verse 4, he speaks concerning the fact that uh, he has established all the ends of the earth. And so he, he's established the foundations of the earth. He's determined its boundaries. Again, speaking of the sovereignty of God. In Job, in chapter 38, I was mentioning Job in one of our recent Bible studies, how that in the first 37 chapters of the book of Job, Job has gone through and quite, a, quite a bit, uh, chapters 1 and 2 especially, you see uh, so much bad happening in the life of Job, so many things from, from losing his possessions, losing his children, and ultimately losing his own, his own health, and his wife turning to him and saying, how long will you hold on to your integrity? Just curse God and die. Uh, you see how he goes through so much pain and all. And, and then when you read through the book of Job, you see that he has a, a, a number of friends who are there beside him who uh, for the first few days are the wisest counselors they could possibly be because they don't say anything. They, they, they show that they're really uh, better counselors when they're quiet than when they open their mouths. Because when they begin to open their mouths, they begin to condemn him. And before you know it, there's an argument, a running argument that's going on uh, between Job and his miserable counselors, as he calls them. And, 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 and on more than one occasion, he says, oh, how I wish I had an attorney who could stand before me and the Lord and plead my case. I could prove myself to be guiltless before him. And, and he goes on and on and on to speak concerning the fact that he, he hadn't done anything wrong. He hasn't done something to deserve 
what he's gone through and all, and he begins to question, and he questions and questions throughout Job. And if you've read the book, you know that. You see a series of questions, arguments going on and on to chapter 37. And then in chapter 38, God says, okay, um, the King James, quit yourself like a man. I'm going to give you some questions, and now you answer me. Now, can you imagine that for a minute? I, you know, you, you want to complain? Who is this? That you, want, you want to argue with me? Okay. Where were you? And then God begins. It's just amazing how simple these questions are that we don't understand the answers for. And he goes on and on and on. And he begins, you can see it like in Job 38, verse 4, where God says, where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? Tell me if you understand. Where were you? When I determined that the sea would go so far and go no further. Job, did I ask you for advice? Did I tell you? I go, would you please explain to me how to create things and lay the foundations of the earth and, and the borders? Can you do that for me? Well, that's what you're seeing here in, uh, in the book of Proverbs, chapter 30, verse 4, when the question is asked, who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name, if you know? Well... What is his son's name? Well, we know that name. It's been revealed to us. His son's name is Jesus. He's saying, if you think a human being determined these things, identify him to me. Now, obviously, Christians see this question as being answered in Jesus Christ. You see that? I could give you so many scriptures. Let me give you a few. Uh, who established all the ends of the earth? In John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was, the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. And without Him, nothing was made that was made. Colossians 1, 15 and 16. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Him, all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, speaking of Jesus, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had made himself when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And so he begins by saying, I am stupid. I do not have understanding. I didn't learn wisdom. I don't have deep knowledge. But before you start thinking of yourself as being special, answer these questions. And that's intended to bring humility to the reader. And so as he goes on, he goes into verse 5 and he says, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who put their trust in him. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. That's powerful. Every word of God is pure. What this does is it just declares the infallibility of the word of God. He says, Every word of God is pure. That word pure speaks of it being trustworthy and flawless. By trusting his word, salvation is secured. And not only is salvation secured, but we also now tap into or receive wisdom from the Lord. In Psalm 119, verses 41 and 42, let your mercies come also to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your word so shall I have an answer for him who reproaches me, for I trust in your word. There is a reason why uh, ministers like, like me and others point the church to the word, because every word of God is pure, and man's word is not. God's word is flawless, but ours is flawed. And so we have simply taken the wise route to trust the Lord. I figure that if there is a God, and there is, and he's all-powerful, and he is, then he most certainly be able to, he must most certainly be able to preserve his word for us, and he has. And so I can trust his word. I can trust it. And this, this Bible tells me about itself 
Every word of God is pure. It also tells me because God's word is flawless, that God is my protector. He is a shield to those who put their trust in him. And so the warning comes in verse 6, do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. Do not add. You see, adding or taking from his word will dilute it, will pollute it, and will gut it of its power. If you try and dumb down God's word so it's not offensive, it, it, it reduces it. You have to give it as it is. There are quite a number of pastors in our day, unfortunately, and many on TV or over the airwaves, who refuse to give the whole counsel of God for fear of offending sensitive hearers. And that's a, that's a tragedy in the church because ultimately we need to understand that it's God's word that we need to embrace. It's, it's the gospel of salvation that we're supposed to proclaim. It's a word of God that provides a defense for us. It's through God's word that we increase, we grow in understanding and learning. It's by God's word that we're blessed. And, and it's through God's word that people are actually saved. Well, that's why Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I'm not ashamed of it. It's God's power. What you do is you release it. You proclaim it and watch what God does in people's lives. And so he says, don't add to his word, lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. When you dilute God's word, it's like taking a recipe, changing it to suit your taste, and then after eating what you've made, saying the recipe was bad. No, you change the recipe. You change the recipe. If you take it as it is, it'll give you what it's intended to do. And the Bible tells us within itself not to be taken away from the word of God and, and not to be adding to it. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2, uh, do not add to what I command you. Do not subtract from it, but keep the commands of the Lord your God that I give you. In Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 12, 32, Whatever I command you, be careful to observe it. You shall not add to it nor take away from it. And then we have a promise found in, in, in Joshua chapter 1, verse 7, where, where we read, Only be strong, very courageous, that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left. Why? Well, that you may prosper wherever you go. So hold fast the word of God. And, and that's what he's saying. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you, and you be found a liar. So that's what motivates us to approach God's word verse by verse. And teachers and preachers of the word of God should be warned by these verses, but many are not. Now he goes on and he starts changing a little bit in the way that he approaches things. Notice verse 7 through 9. Two things I request of you. Deprive me not before I die. Remove falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty, poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food allotted to me, lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. So he makes requests here. And notice he says two things. First, and he says, Deprive me not. Uh, first, I want to have integrity. God, help me to live as an honest person. God, I would like to have a pure heart. Psalm 51, verse 6, Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. God, I want to have integrity. I want to have a wholeness. Like Jesus said, let your yes be yes, and your no, well, let it be no. You should have the kind of character and reputation so that those who know you know you're a person of your word, is what he's saying. And here, he's simply saying, these things I request of you, deprive me not before I die. One, remove falsehood and lies far from me. I, I want to be a person of integrity. I want to speak the truth. And then he says, and give me neither poverty nor riches, Feed me with the food allotted to me, lest I be full and deny you and say, Where's, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my Lord. So he says, one, I want to have integrity. And two, I want to live 
in moderation. I want to have a balanced life. I, I, I want to remain in the place that I am dependent upon you. You see, if I, if I have too much, I might cease trusting you for my daily bread. But on the other hand, if I have little, I might steal, and in doing so, bring shame to your name. The fact is, wealth tends to prideful self-sufficiency and poverty to dishonesty and lying. So his desire is to learn to live in moderation. And so, two things I request of you. I was in uh, San Luis Obispo the other day. When it says two things, I thought of something that said three things. It was on a, it was on a poster, and it said uh, three things that do not lie. A child, a drunk, and yoga pants. And that's probably true. <laughs> That was so dumb. I just stood there laughing. <laughs> Three things that don't lie. A child, a drunken yoga pants. But anyway, so <laughs> I'll move on. That's not here in Proverbs. That's in, <laughs> that's in my version of Proverbs. Let's see. Where are we? Verse 10. Do not malign a servant to his master, lest he curse you and you be found guilty. Uh, this, the literal application of this is don't meddle in the affairs of other people. Don't put yourself in between uh, individuals who are having difficulties. Don't meddle in their affairs just to get involved. Uh, it's interesting how he puts it here when he says, do not malign a servant to his master lest he curse you and you be found guilty. In the book of Romans, in chapter 14, the question is asked in verse 4, who are you to judge another man's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him to stand. So he's simply saying, don't meddle in other people's affairs unasked for. Leave it alone and let them deal with it themselves. Verse 11, there is a generation that curses its father and doesn't bless its mother. There's a generation that is pure in its own eyes yet is not washed from its filthiness. There's a generation, oh, how lofty are their eyes, their eyelids are lifted up. There's a generation whose teeth are like swords, whose fangs are like knives, to devour the poor from off the earth and the needy from among men. So it's interesting how he speaks of this generation, this generation that is pure in its own eyes and yet not washed from its filthiness. One observer stated that this is very interestingly similar to what you find in the New Testament prophetic a word related to the conditions of the earth prior to the return of Jesus Christ. And, and uh, for many years, when you can see this, I've seen this when it says there's a generation that curses its father, doesn't bless its mother. Uh, I believe very, very deeply that we're in that generation, that we're in, we're in that generation in these last days. Um, the amount of disrespect that you see in families, even in Christian families, sadly, sometimes. The amount of disrespect that a child will have for a father or a mother, grandfather or a grandmother. And uh, they, they're despising, they're, they're disregarding them. They're, 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 they're not blessing their family. So you see that even right now. And so it speaks concerning the fact that they curse their father and don't bless their mother. You see in Exodus in chapter 20, verse 12, uh, there's a command, honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God has given you. Those are commands of the Lord. This is the first command that is given with a blessing. And so God says, no, you honor your parents and, and I will bless you. Now, when it speaks concerning honoring your parent, honoring your parent includes refraining from language that might lessen them in the eyes of other people. Or, or treating parents with, with terrible language or treating them poorly. You know, we're living, again, in an odd time, and I'm not going to make this the, the crux of my message tonight, but it's true. We're living in a time when, when, when older children uh, will call their aged parents. Their parents could be in their 70s or 80s, and they get a, a phone call from a kid who's still mad at them because he didn't get a pony, you know, and, and, and I'm blaming you for my whole life because you didn't hold me, or you didn't let me play in Little League, 
and, and they keep these things and they blame their parents. And, and we see that all the time. Uh, when, when, was, when did it become okay to call your old, old dad and tell him how bad he raised you? When did that become okay? But it's okay now. It's all right. People do it. They get mad at their dad. They'll go to the psych and they'll tell the psych how they didn't get the things that they wanted. And they blame their parents. They don't honor their father and they don't honor their mother. They're not valuing them. And he's saying this, an evil generation doesn't love or honor their parents. He says in verse 12, it's pure in its own eyes, yet is not washed from its filthiness. It's a generation of people who think that they're morally pure, but they're in sin. They're, they're in sin, but they think they're, you know, it's okay the way that they're living, but they're in sin. Proverbs 20, verse 9 asks the question, who can say I've made my heart clean? I'm pure from my sin. And there are people who are like that. People, and I see that in an odd way today, pure in their own sight, and yet not washed from filthiness. And, and I do think that, and I don't know how to say this properly. I'll say it, and hopefully it'll make some sense. But I, I believe that we're living in a time when people are not thinking issues through very clearly. And so you'll say one thing and then someone will, a person can say one thing and then say something that directly contradicts it and yet nobody calls them out on it because they either they don't notice the contradiction or somebody says, um, um, I don't believe in capital punishment. That's a common thing that people say. I don't believe in capital punishment. And they will march and they will argue and they will say capital punishment is wrong. You shouldn't take the life of another human being. And the same person can march for uh, pro-choice. Same person. A person who says that you shouldn't execute a criminal says you can execute a baby. And I've often wondered why they don't see the contradiction if you're pro-life. Why aren't you completely pro-life? But we see that today. And so there's a generation that doesn't consider itself sinful. It's a generation that is pure in its own eyes, yet is not washed from its filthiness. He says in verse 13, there's a generation, how lofty are their eyes, their eyelids are lifted up. There's a generation whose teeth are like swords, whose fangs are like knives to devour the poor from off the earth and the needy from among men. And so... Uh, this generation is one that exploits the poor. And he says that these who are exploiting the poor are like beasts. Uh, there are those who hire day laborers and then refuse to pay them. There are supervisors who use women and threaten them the loss of their job if they don't sleep with them. I know that because I've had women come and speak to me about finding themselves in that situation where they said, you know what? I needed money. I'm a single mom. And my, my supervisor was saying, if I didn't yield to him, I was going to lose my job. And they come in and speak and their hearts are broken. And there's this, there's this evil. It's a generation whose teeth are like swords. Fangs are like knives. They devour the poor and the needy. And that's true. Taking advantage, taking advantage of people in that way. In Proverbs 22, 16, he who oppresses the poor to increase his riches and he who gives to the rich will surely come to poverty. And so he's pointing out to the evil, uh, the evil that takes place. And indeed, it still does to this day. Moving on, verse 15, the leech has two daughters, give and give. That's the name of the daughters, by the way. And he goes on to say, there are three things that are never satisfied, four never say enough. The grave, the barren womb, the earth that is not satisfied with water, and the fire never says enough. And so these are illustrations of unfulfilled desire, things that appear insatiable. He speaks of greed, a barren womb. The barren womb is the unfulfilled desire to have a baby. He speaks of the grave. He speaks of dry ground. And he speaks of a fire. And all of those never seem to be satisfied. The fire never says that's enough. 
I mean, we've been going through fires here in California, haven't we? And uh, it, it, the point is that it just keeps burning. As long as there's something to burn, it continues to burn. And so it's basically just pointing out that there are things that are unfulfilled, and these are illustrations of unfulfilled desires. Verse 17, the eye that mocks his father and scorns obedience to his mother, the ravens of the valley will pick it out. The young eagles will eat it. Isn't that nice? What is he? What a gross image. But what, what is he saying? Disrespect warrants severe punishment. Verses 18 and 19. There are three things which are too wonderful for me. Yes, four, which I do not understand. The way of an eagle in the air, the way of a serpent on a rock, the way of a ship in the midst of the sea. And then he adds this, the way of a man with a virgin. Now I can figure out the other three. What are you, <laughs> what are you talking about? Well, these things are all propelled in a way that can't be seen. And each one is propelled according to its own purpose. So he's speaking of a smooth beauty of an eagle in flight. And if you've ever seen an eagle in flight, then you can say that is absolutely majestic. He speaks of an interesting way that a snake can move. And that's true. Um, he speaks of a ship being propelled through the ocean through currents, and then he speaks of the inner motives of a man as he pursues a woman, the way of a man with a virgin. His motives are not clear. We could probably spend some time looking at that. We're not going to, but as I was thinking about that, there are unseen motivations. There are some men who see the purity of a woman as being a prize for himself that he wants to take from her so he could say he gained it. And there are others have, who have a, a proper righteous sense that this woman, this unmarried woman, in this case she's referred to as a virgin, this unmarried woman, the motivation of his heart is one of purity, where he loves her, desires her, but waits for the right moment after marriage to consummate his heart's desire with her. So he's speaking about hidden motives. There are things that you can't see. There are things that you, you don't know what is propelling them. And uh, in the case of a relationship, uh, the greatest thing that we as men could do is we could see that God has given to us the role of protecting women. Now, some women, women don't want to hear that today. I understand that. There are a lot of women who say, you know, I don't need some man to protect me, and I get it. That's all right, and uh, if that's the way you feel. But men were created to protect women. We were created to do that. And a man who doesn't protect a woman, if you don't mind, isn't a man. A man has been created to protect a woman. That's what we do. And if someone's going to harm a woman, we should stand up and take harm upon ourselves if necessary. And a woman who doesn't appreciate that just doesn't understand that's how God made us. God made us to protect. Every little boy is born with a little hero in his heart. That's a fact. Am I wrong? I mean, when you, I don't know about you, guys, I'll talk to men. Women, ignore this. But men, <laughs> every one of us is a superhero. I mean, even when we were kids, when we were growing up, and it was, you know, yeah, before I got saved, I got saved at 20 when I was a little boy. Yeah, I went trick-or-treating and 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 you know and I put on costumes yeah and you know what I was never a ballerina <laughs> no no you go dressed as Superman Green Lantern some superhero and 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 that isn't pretend we saw those as options that's what we were gonna be when we were older there's a hero in every heart of every male. There's a hero in there. Now, this may sound old-fashioned, but God created us that way. He created us that way. That's why we're supposed to protect our wives and not hurt them. 
That's why we're supposed to honor and cherish our wives because we were created to do that. We were created for that. And even a teeny little mouse, a little male mouse, will go after a cat who's going after his, his, his girl. That's the way it is. That's a fact. It's true. You're a little mighty mouse. Yeah, I heard that. I heard that. Me, I was Speedy Gonzalez. <laughs> but it's true. It's true. So motives are unseen. There are some men who act as the gentleman, but he's not being a gentleman. What he's being is a con in order that he might take something. And there's the man who values. It's all unseen. And so that becomes almost mysterious in relationship because some men aren't pure. And some women have experienced men who are not pure. And that's why it can be, for her, difficult to trust because she doesn't know if this guy's sincere or if he's just using words to try and take her. And so these are unseen things. And so he speaks about it in that way. He speaks about an eagle in the air. He's gliding, but you don't see what he's gliding on. The serpent on a rock, it moves, but he doesn't have little feet, so that's interesting. The way of a ship in the midst of the sea. There are currents, and then there's the motivation of a man with a woman. And he says, they're wonderful and things I don't understand. Verse 20 this is the way of an adulterous woman. She eats and wipes her mouth and says, I've done no wickedness. I haven't done anything wrong. And, uh, you know, <laughs> this, this adulterous woman, I have done no wickedness. Um, sometimes women who have done wrong have no shame, is the point he's making. No remorse over her actions. And there are quite a number of people, by the way, today that we reward who are exactly this way. They're making movies, they're making music, they're in plays, and we reward her. And she says things and does things, sometimes marches, sometimes speaks at rallies, and we reward her. And so he's saying she is somebody who does wrong and has no sense of shame for doing that. And that's absolutely true. We see that all the time in American culture. Verse 21, for three things the earth is perturbed, yes, for four it cannot bear up. For a servant when he reigns, a fool when he is filled with food, a hateful woman when she's married, <laughs> mm. and <laughs> a maid servant who succeeds her mistress. And so, this speaks of abuses of power and position. He's saying a servant, when he reigns, can be unbearable, especially when he lords it over other servants. Have you ever had a job that you've taken and you're the new hire and somebody who's making the exact same wage you're making has no position of authority on that job site, comes walking up and says, I'll show you the ropes and tries to bully you into following his orders? I have had that. You know, and, and he's saying it. This is, this is an abuse of power. This is a servant uh, when he reigns. Well, the servant can be unbearable. He's lording it over the other people. He speaks of a fool when he's filled with food. And well, when, when he, is, he is filled with food, that means that he's made enough money to become wealthy. So a fool when filled with food is an interesting way of saying this is somebody who's made some money but has no class. Um, years ago, ancient history time, some of you may have seen this in reruns that are almost 100 years old, but they had the Beverly Hillbillies. Do you remember? Anybody remember the Beverly Hillbillies? Beverly Hillbillies. He was very rich because he had $15 million, I think. And at that time, that was huge money back then. You know, but they were classless. <laughs> you know, Granny and Jed and Ellie Mae and the rest of them. Yes, I did watch it. And yes, <laughs> and I can still sing the song, which I won't. Uh, but that was the whole joke of the thing is that these were nouveau riche. These were people who had just gotten money but didn't know how to do anything with it. 
They didn't know how to use it. They weren't raised in, in, in certain prep schools. They didn't have class, and that was the whole comedy of it. But there's a fact to it. When, when somebody gets a whole lot of money and has not been raised in a way to know how to handle it, well, they definitely can become very difficult. He, he speaks of a hateful woman when she's married. <laughs> well, what is wrong with that? Well, a hateful woman, a woman filled with hate when she's married, uh, has a tendency of making a husband miserable. That's the point he's making. She can make her husband miserable because she's filled with hate. And then you have a maidservant who succeeds her mistress. And um, <laughs> the maidservant who succeeds her mistress can make the job site into a battleground. And that's the point he's making there. Verse 24, there are four things which are little on the earth, but they are exceedingly wise. The ants are a people not strong, yet they prepare their food in the summer. The rock badgers are a feeble folk, yet they make their homes in the crags. The locust has no king, yet they all advance in ranks. The spider skillfully grasps with its hands, it's in king's palaces. Now, this is interesting as I was looking at this and saying, okay, what is this supposed to mean? Well, he speaks in a variety of ways. He, he, he's not saying that they're wise in themselves. It's not saying that ants have wisdom hidden in that big ant head <laughs> or rock badgers for that matter. He's saying Ants are demonstrating wisdom, and this, this is very practical, because the ant prepares for future needs. Mark that down. That is so important. We're living in a time where people are living on money that they haven't yet made. We're, we're using our cards and, and, and all extending ourselves with credit to such a degree that it's, it's oppressing people. They're, they're unwise. And, and I'm going to tell you, the generation my father came from influenced my generation in a way that the newer generation hasn't really been influenced. My father's generation came out of the Depression, so his attitude was save don't spend, buy cash, be careful. That was my dad. So my dad was very frugal. My dad was, was someone who didn't go out and get himself in debt. My dad taught me that, uh, that credit was to be used sparingly and that the most important thing that I have is my reputation and that my credit ought to be solid. And my dad said, son, I still remember my dad saying this, son. And he didn't lecture me very often. That's why I remember things he tried to teach me. He said, son, there are two things, two things that you're going to sign your name on a contract for that are going to cost you that are very expensive. He said, your house and your car. He said, so make sure you take care of your house and make sure you take care of your car. That's how my dad was. And so he gave to me very practical advice. And so as I got older, and it was time, Marie and I, my, my girlfriend who became my wife, it was time for us to get married. We didn't spend a lot of money on a, on a wedding. Our wedding was in a backyard. We didn't, we didn't, you know, go into debt to get married. We didn't. I mean, we, we, we what's the word? We spoiled our guests by giving them Colonel Sanders, you know? I mean, that was their dinner, you know? And then I spoiled her by taking her to, was it Jack in the Box? <laughs> That's the truth. I'm not even kidding. But I did buy shrimp because that was expensive on that menu at that time. I bought some shrimp and French fries. It was good, huh? It was good. <laughs> we didn't get married and go into debt. We just didn't do it. There are people who spend 10000 I'm not knocking. I'm making an observation. $10,000 on a wedding ring. 10000 bucks. Just the other day, uh, one of my staff members said, gone to Hawaii to do a filming for a surprise uh, proposal. And uh, the proposal was taken on a ledge a 30, over, over a 30-foot cliff, a 30-foot cliff. And, and, and my friend was hiding inside of some bushes, 
filming the surprise proposal. And so the guy gets on his knee. They're right on the ledge. He pulls out the ring. The little girl he's proposing to just freaks out. And he, she puts it on. They put it on. And then he says, well, there's something written on the inside of the band. So she takes it off and drops it. It falls 30 feet into water beneath. And he's got this on tape. <laughs> the guy's freaking out like, and, and so they hired divers to try and find the ring. And they were there for some time. That ring was very expensive. And some fish is wearing it right now. <laughs> Now, I'm not laughing at his disaster, but that's how fast it goes. Don't forget it. That's as fast as it goes. She had it on her hand less than a minute. So be very careful with the things you go into hawk for. I've, I've, ad, I've advised a young uh, soon-to-be-marrieds who want to have extravagant weddings. Again, if that's what you want, you want the princess you know, bride kind of thing and all of that. You want to come out with, you know, the big train and this and that. That's up to you. I mean, it's your dream. But I've told the guys, I've said, you know, just remember, if it were me and I had that kind of money, probably wouldn't get married. But two, uh, <laughs> if it were me, uh, I would, I would, I would not have the big extravaganza with all the lights in the tent and all of the, the uh, peacocks and you name it. You know, I wouldn't do that. Uh, I'd have a cheap wedding, probably have Elvis do it. And uh, <laughs> I'd have an inexpensive one the way Marie and I did. And if I had that kind of money, I'd invest it towards my future and uh, probably take her on a very nice Honeymoon, that's what I would do. See, I didn't take you on a very nice honeymoon, did I? No, I took her to the mountains. We borrowed, we borrowed a friend of mine's cabin, and we had one great meal, that, that hamburger and the shrimp. And, and the next day, she was cooking. She hasn't stopped. I mean, that she says, she still complains to me, don't you? You didn't even take me out to eat dinner. I was cooking for the day we got married, as God intended. Because I'm your hero. So, so I protect you. Anyway, <laughs> I'm in trouble. You know that. I, it, it, I don't care. I ain't afraid. Uh, <laughs> So one, ants prepare. They prepare their food in the summer. Always remember, you know, things happen sometimes to upset the apple cart. It's good to be able, if you're able to, it's always good to put something away and to be prepared. Secondly, he speaks of rock badgers. Rock badgers, when you go to Israel, you'll see rock badgers all over. Uh, we go into a place called En Gedi. They're also called conies. And the rock badgers... Um, he speaks concerning the rock badgers. Notice he says they're a feeble folk. They're, they're very small. They're, they're a rodent. They're not really that large. They're feeble and weak. Yet they make their homes in the crags. Um, they realize that they're weak, but their protection isn't of themselves. They're actually as strong as the, as the rocks that they climb into. See, you could have a huge animal chasing a rock badger, and that rock badger is unable to protect itself but it becomes strong by hiding in something that provides strength for it, which is the rocks. And so this big animal can't reach it because it's being protected by the rock, which Psalm 62 verse 6 says, speaking of God, he only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. So there's wisdom in being sheltered in the rock. And that's the point he's making here because they can't get to you. He protects you. He speaks of uh, the locust. A locust has no, 
no king, yet they all advance in ranks. Um, locusts have organization, it's what he's pointing to. They have cooperation. And because they're organized as a group and 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 all, they're very formidable. I, I found that interesting because I've, I've heard so many times of swarms of locusts. So I looked up one incident. It's called uh, an incident referring to Albert's Swarm. Albert's Swarm speaks of locusts that in 1875 overran an area of the United States throughout the West and into Canada that was estimated to cover 198,000 square miles, greater than the area of California, and that whole swarm weighed 27.5 million tons and was made up of 12.5 trillion insects. And so he's speaking of these locusts. They have no king, but they advance, and that's the point, and they do. And then he speaks of the spider. The word spider there, if you were to take some time to look it up in a, a Bible dictionary for Hebrew, the word spider actually isn't speaking of a spider so much as a lizard. And perhaps some of your, your Bibles may say a lizard or a gecko because that's the, that's the picture here. And it's speaking about it skillfully grasped with its hands. I don't know if you know this, but even right now in modern warfare, the United States is working on... Um, certain kinds of uh, gear for your hands and your feet that are modeled after geckos. And they have a lot of uh, like fibers on the hands and on the, on the, the feet, uh, the portion like socks. And the soldiers can actually climb up glass with it. And they're using that from the gecko. And so he's saying that this is a, a small lizard, if you will, that can climb and it finds itself in king's palaces. And so um, it's elusive, but it's bold enough to live in a king's home. What's the point? Well, they're all small, but they illustrate a wisdom that people can learn from. And then finally, verse 29, there are three things which are majestic in pace. Yes, four, which are stately in walk. A lion, which is mighty among beasts, doesn't turn away from any a greyhound, a male goat also, and a king whose troops are with him. Now that's interesting. It's picturing leadership here. Three things which are majestic in pace. It's a picture of a leader. And so leadership is revealed as having majesty and courage. Leadership can be stately. And by using that, that male goat, I thought, now, why a male goat? Well, the male goat walks in front, and it's a picture of confidence. And so leadership is majestic, courageous, stately, and confident. And that illustrates how those who lead should conduct themselves. Would to God that our leaders, even here in the United States, would learn from this passage and, and have more stateliness in the way that they lead. Because if there's anything that irritates me, it's when somebody's in a position of leadership and they don't seem to honor the reality of what that means. And then verse 32, if you have been foolish in exalting yourself or if you have devised evil, put your hand on your mouth. For as the churning of milk produces butter and wringing the nose produces blood, so the forcing of wrath produces strife. This is an exhortation and he closes this portion with an exhortation to self-control. He's saying, don't exalt yourself. Plan honorably and without deception. Exercise self-control. Strive for peace through unity, righteousness, and humility. Don't exalt yourself. Don't be saying things. Put your hand over your mouth. Don't be provoking people. Don't force wrath. If you lead, then do so through unity. Do so through righteousness. And do so with humility.